Well, hello friends. Welcome back to Embrace the Question. Steve here, and it's another episode of Bible Study with me. We're completing Genesis this week and next week. So that is Genesis 49 today. Genesis 49 is interesting. It, it's very, you might think, cryptic because... Jacob is about to die. He is literally not going to last until chapter 50. This is, this is our end of Jacob's story. And Jacob does something here that you wonder when you're reading it if he really understands what he's doing because he's prophesying. Now, that's interesting because when you think of the Old Testament, you think of prophets. That's just, I mean, that's where all the prophets are, right? When you get into the major ones, the Isaiahs, the Ezekiels, the Daniels, the Samuels, and the minor ones, like the Joels and the Jonas and the Amoses and the, you know, the guys that wrote the small books, in comparison with those who wrote the big books. You think prophets when you think of the Old Testament, and yet in Genesis we only have, well, let's, let's talk about Torah. In Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, there are only 13 instances of the word prophet in 11 verses, and most of those are in Deuteronomy. Prophesy is one time in the Torah, and prophecy doesn't show up at all. That's interesting to me because Torah is kind of our foundation in this Old Testament account of everything. And there's very little, prophets really don't come into play yet. And yet we are going to listen to Jacob prophesy over his sons. That's kind of neat. That's pretty powerful. The one real, the one real instance we have of prophet being spoken about comes in Genesis 20 when God is not even speaking to a, a Jew or someone in the family. He's speaking to, I believe it was Abimelech about Abraham, saying, God's speaking, and he's saying, this is my prophet. I don't know if Abraham even realized he was a prophet. But God says, you're dealing with a prophet here. Meaning that a prophet represents God to the people. That's the job of a prophet. The job of a priest is exactly the opposite, to represent the people to God. So when you have someone that's both prophet and priest, oh, now we have someone who can represent both God to the people and the people to God. That was a foreign idea in that day. So we had either prophets, apparently, a few of them, or we had priests, and we had a few more of those. That was not a new idea of being a priest. Even in Abraham's day, he met, he met Melchizedek, who was a priest, the priest of Salem. Remember that one. So let's read through this, Genesis 49, and take a look at these prophecies. All right, again, this is the commercial, but before we start, get you some Solway Coffee. SolwayCoffee.com, a good friend of mine, has acted upon this, and he's already posting it to Facebook, which I was very proud of, and... Uh, He's enjoying the coffee, so grab some. SolwayCoffee.com and support a kingdom cause. If you hear gunfire in the background, it's not gunfire. It's 
Well, it's the day after the 4th of July and our people around here are still setting off fireworks, so they're hopefully not shooting at me. All right, let's go. Verse 1, then Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in days to come. So here he is beginning to prophesy. Verse 2, assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob, listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the firstfruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. We talked about that briefly last week because we knew that the birthright was passing from Reuben. And the writer of First Chronicles, which we believe is Ezra, he apparently had referred to this text in his chronicle in chapter 5, verse 1, when he talked about just this. Reuben defiled his father's couch, which was later absolutely declared against the Mosaic law, right? You don't do this. And Jacob is not letting him get by with it. So before I continue, I mean, this really is interesting. Is Jacob, is he just pouring out his heart or has he heard from God? Is he hearing from God as he's speaking? Because what we will find out is that all of this comes to pass. All of it. Very fascinating. I don't even realize, I don't know that Jacob realizes what he's doing. He's just declaring the blessing of the Father onto the sons, which is a bit like reading the will before you're dead. You know, this is kind of movie-esque in that Typically, this kind of information comes from the lawyer. You know, here's the bad news, Junior. You don't get the whole plantation. This is because you made your dad mad back in that instance. You know, it's very soap opera type stuff. Jacob's reading his will before he dies. And God enforces all of this. Okay, so here we go. Verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men. And in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger. For it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. All right. We are going to come back to this, but I have something to say about it at the moment, which is he's talking about the incident at Shechem, that really bloody thing where Dinah, their sister, was defiled by Shechem, who decided he wanted to marry her came and respectfully requested for her after he had already violated her. So I say respectfully. His brothers didn't buy it. And Reuben and Simeon and Levi and all these guys, especially Simeon and Levi, they went in and wiped out the whole village and apparently did some things that were considered quite unethical, even in war, almost war crimes-ish, hamstringing oxen, that type of thing. Okay, so they are losing their inheritance too. We find out that that actually happens. In fact, when Moses is doling out inheritances, Simeon is completely left off the list. He doesn't even show up. Levi doesn't get a land inheritance either. They are, they are given some cities, but they don't get land because they have been chosen as priests of the Most High. 
So here we have literally this prophecy coming to pass in a few hundred years. Simeon is dispersed in Israel, and there's a time when he is very difficult to even find. He's been so scattered. Amazing that Jacob foresaw all of this. All right, now we can continue verse... Eight, and I will come back and talk about that a bit. Verse 8. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. Yours may say a lion's whelp. A young, fierce lion. Think of that. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. I find that a fascinating statement, because you and I both know that the Messiah comes through Judah. Judah has taken the preeminence that belonged to Reuben. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between, his, from between his feet until the tribute comes to him. What's the tribute? We can tie that into a host of messianic prophecies that will come later, but we know that Jesus, all of the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God, and how is that going to look? To him shall be the obedience of the peoples. It's still being fulfilled, this verse. So verse 11 is actually part of it. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his, govern his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. What does that look like? Well, when we go over to the book of Revelation, John saw the king of kings, and Jesus himself, in a garment that looked like it had been dipped in blood. Okay? Everything here is circular in, nation, in, in, its, in its form. It's circular in its fulfillment. They would say that the Alpha and the, the Omega. Now I'm, now I'm going into unknown territory. I didn't plan to say any of this, but he is the Alpha and the Omega. What that means to the Jewish mind is he is the Aleph, the first, and the Tav, the last. So he is the beginning of the cycle. And he is the end of the cycle. And what that means is that all of this connects. It all connects. So what we see here in Genesis, we also see in the end time vision, Revelation, right? He has determined the end from the beginning. That's what the prophet said. All right. His eyes... Still talking about Judah, verse 12. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. What does that indicate? Talking about the richness of, of Judah as the ruler. It's, again, messianic. Okay. So, verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships. And his border shall be at Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey, crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. So he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way a viper by the path, 
that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backwards. That doesn't sound too favorable, does it? Issachar sounds like he found something good but became slave to it. Dan mm, will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel, but he's going to be a serpent in the way. He's going to be a problem, kind of a, a, a stumbling block, if you will. A serpent in the way is a danger to those who are traveling. So then Jacob is saying this, and like I say, it seems cryptic, and it is cryptic. And he takes a deep breath and he says, verse 18, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. I think this is sapping Jacob's strength. In verse 19, raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. That sounds to me like Gad is in a pretty good spot here. He's, he's not going to be the victim. Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. That sounds like a favorable prophecy. Naphtali, or Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. Favorable. Joseph, now you know this one's going to be good. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Hmm, messianic reference. By the God of your father who will help you. By the Almighty who will bless you with Blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. These, the blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents. Up to the bounties of the everlasting hills, may they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. He, he loved jo Joseph. Some of this I feel like was just pouring out of the compassion of Jacob while God put his stamp of approval on all of it. I wonder how much was just out of the heart of Jacob. I do wonder that. So verse 27, Joseph's brother, the only two sons from Rachel, his beloved. Okay, so let's see what happens to Benjamin. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey, and at the evening dividing the spoil. That's favorable to Benjamin, not necessarily anyone who gets in his way. In fact, we know that Benjamin becomes mighty in war as a tribe. The tribe of Benjamin was, they were capable, they were capable. Verse 28, all these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what the father, this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to them. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. And when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. And we get the 21 gun salute outside. That was the end of the, the account of Israel and the end of the beginning. Because from here on, the foundation of what becomes the Messianic line is firmly established. Now, what's interesting to me, 
12 tribes with 12 blessings associated with them. If we read in Ezekiel, and I believe it's 37, but I'm not sure because I haven't looked I haven't looked it up recently. I believe it's Ezekiel 37, the prophecy of Tyre and the king of Tyre, which most scholars associate, I think rightly, with a prophecy about Lucifer himself or Satan. Okay. Uh, Lucifer, the one who was the, the snake in the garden. Okay, that's the one. And it says, you were with, you were in the garden of God, Eden. That's the prophecy. You were in the garden of God and every precious stone was your covering. That sounds like this being, this celestial being, Lucifer wore an ephod like the priests were supposed to wear, okay? We know from Torah that the priests, the Levitical priests, were assigned to wear an ephod, and these had four rows of three stones on them, one for each tribe. These stones also were found on the ephod of Satan, as described in the book of Ezekiel, the ephod of, I should say, Lucifer, okay? What's interesting about that is that there are three stones missing in the Ezekiel ephod for Lucifer. There's a row missing. He has three rows of three. And if you look to see which stones are missing, it's a bit of a study. I'll grant you that because I have attempted it more than once. And every stone is associated with a tribe. So the chore, the challenge, is to figure out which stones of which tribes are missing. It appears that the missing row in Lucifer's ephod is the stone for Reuben, the stone for Simeon, and the stone for Levi. What's interesting about that is that these are the first three that we find that didn't get the full inheritance from their father because of their sin, because one defiled their father's couch. We can call that incest. We can call that adultery. We can call it something. It was pretty serious. Then we find that Simeon and Levi were simply bloody. They were violent. These, why should these particular stones be missing from that particular ephod? That's fun stuff to go in and look at. Then you decide, well, which ones are there? Why would they be there? And I've heard other people that have done this study that arrive with a completely different set of missing stones. So it's difficult to be dogmatic about it, to be conclusive, but it is still fun. Well, that was, that was a good chapter. It was, like I say, a little cryptic. There's a lot we could focus on with each tribal member. As we move through Torah, the story of the tribes becomes really really more and more important and fascinating. Why did two and a half tribes decide not to go into the promised land? Can that be tied to the promise, the prophecy that Jacob made? This is good scholarship. This is worth looking at your Bible a little bit to find that, that stuff out. So I hope you enjoyed that. It's, it's the last chapter next week. Then we're going to have to delve into something new. And you've had some great suggestions. And I'm not 100% yet. But I'm really itching to get into to Exodus. Because to me, Exodus is so much of a, just an incredible story.
just to read it is wow. I love Exodus. So I'm probably leaning towards Exodus at this point. Hope you're staying with me. If you haven't subscribed, I invite you to. And be sure and hit the little bell because otherwise YouTube isn't really obliged to put what you're subscribed to in front of you every week unless you hit the bell. It's the way it is. Hope you guys have a great week. Talk to you soon. Visit the blog, please, and say hello to me. Peace out.